The scientific revolution starts now. I'll just begin at the beginning. Then I'm uh, I'm also uh, trained in the hard sciences. My uh, primary degree is in the earth sciences. I'm a degree geologist uh, with a very strong background in math, physics, computer science, astronomy, and archaeology. Kind of married all of those together. And I was uh, I was in the academic world at a really interesting time. It was in the the early to mid 1970s when computers were just coming into vogue in the industry. They had been used, you know, filling up entire rooms for research, but they were making a transition. Uh, and I was actually hired out of the university without my degree in the energy industry in the 1970s when uh, in the energy crisis of the 70s, because I, I had a very unusual background in uh, geology and computer science, doing subsurface mapping of uh, geologic structures very similar to the the kind of mapping that happens with climatological and atmospheric models uh, but they had to, to tweak the software so i i completed my degree uh by going nights and also i i received credit for the work that i was doing in the industry which was uh at that time it, it was unusual to do that uh and i i've been very blessed uh to be hired as a problem solver for fortune 500 companies from that time forward first in the energy crisis of the 70s and during the cold war years in the uh the defense industry uh, and i just a little caveat i didn't apply to go into the defense industry i wanted to work in space exploration and at that time the viking mission had just uh, successfully well, two probes, Viking 1 and Viking 2, one orbited the planet Mars, one landed on the planet, and the orbiter took 19,000 photographs that were showing a lot of mysterious structures. And as a geologist, I was fascinated by that. So I applied to the company, they hired me, and because it was during the Cold War, they placed me in the defense side of the house as a senior computer systems designer uh, for a project that was called SDI, Star Wars Defense Initiative. Mm. So that allowed me, and I had a lot of problems with that, just uh, spiritually, uh, you know, consciousness. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about those struggles. It was also good for me because I learned about the industry. I learned about how people think when they are in fear. Uh, I was exposed to some of the most advanced technology in terms of lasers, space-based lasers, uh, weapon systems, weapon systems integration, uh, and also geopolitics, because it was the East against the West, the former Soviet Union against <laughs> against the former United States of America, because neither country is the same country anymore. Mm, and uh, and when I, I left that, uh, I took that expertise, and I became the first uh, technical operations manager at Cisco Systems. Uh, in 1990, right before they had the protocol converters that became the foundation of what we now call the the internet, and uh, and each of those positions, uh, I it was good for me because I learned about people, how they think, but ultimately, those were my daytime jobs. And at night and on weekends, my background in archaeology and ancient civilizations uh, has always led me to believe. Shiloh, you asked me this specifically, mm. why, you know, what was on my mind. I've always believed, and I continue to believe, that if we know where to look, and if we know how to look into the wisdom of our past, that there is a continuity. Is it ancient? Yes. Is it obsolete? No. There is a, a continuity of knowledge. And if we know how to recognize what our ancestors have left for us, we would avoid the... Uh, the hurt and the suffering that the wars of our past have caused, including the war that I was participating in during the Cold War years. And I feel like uh, it has always been one of the prime directives of my life is to bring forward whatever knowledge is available, uh, crossing the traditional boundaries between the sciences, uh, crossing the boxes between physics and geology and chemistry and biology. You know, the world doesn't work that way. We, obviously, we, we put 
those boxes there so that we're comfortable studying those things. But by crossing those traditional boundaries, we gain deeper insights into ourselves. And, and for me, hopefully, so that we will never have the kind of wars and hurt one another in this lifetime and beyond the way that we have in the past. So that has been a prime directive for me. It covers a lot of ground. Uh, I, I did a radio interview right before COVID. Uh, it was in New York, a commuter, uh, a morning commuter radio program <laughs> that caught me off guard. It's what I call a hostile interview. You don't get mm. many of them, but, but they happen sometimes. Hmm. And uh, yeah. the, the guy, the, the interviewer, the, the host, he came on. I didn't say good morning, no introduction, nothing like that, you know. Oh, no. He, first thing he said to me, he said, uh, he says, Greg Braden, why can't you stick with one topic like everybody else? He says, man, you're all over the place. Are you talking about the magnetic fields of the planet, ancient civilizations? Are you talking about epigenetics and DNA? At first, I, I thought he was joking. And then he yeah. just, I realized he was serious. And I, it caught me off guard. And, and I said to him, I said, well, it's true that my work over these years covers a lot of ground, but if you look closely, each book I've written, there are 15 books out there right now, each one explores one facet of our relationship to ourselves and to our world and to the cosmos and to our past and ultimately to our future. So in a very real sense, I've stayed with one topic. It's just a big topic. It's us. And he said, okay, let's go to a station break. And he never came back. That was the, oh, end. Wow. <laughs> that was the end of the interview. So, you know, you never know how that's going to work. But I mean, uh, I think in general, we need, there's, a, there's an update. There's a conscious update that needs to happen in discourse, right? I think that I, I read a really interesting critique that was referencing Plato and, and how he actually thought the debate was a useless form of discussion. Because in reality, what we should be doing when we ha meet somebody with opposing views is consider that it's both of us against some problem that neither one of us 100% understands. And if we approach a problem like that, it's not me versus you, it's, or, or you know, you versus the radio host or whatever. It's, it's always us versus understanding what's going on with nature, essentially. And if we could do that, I think science would move a lot faster. But so often you see scientists pitted against one another and it's almost this cage fight mentality. Yeah. And, and it seems really destructive to progress in general. No, I, I agree. You know, my publishers tried to do that. When I, for example, one of my early books was uh, about information that had just been released in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were the oldest record of the Old Testament, uh, pushing the date of that wisdom back over a thousand years than what had been previously known. And the reason they were discovered in the mid 1940s, they weren't released until the early 90s. And the mm. reason for that was because there was information revealed in the scrolls that had been edited out of the, the text that formed the foundation of two thirds of the world's religious population, the Christian, Judeo Christian uh, traditions. So my publisher, they wanted to create controversy, and I pushed back on that. Uh, it's not my nature, but they wanted to, to pit this against, uh, you know, what was accepted at that time. But what you're saying, Shiloh, I, I agree. It's actually the way I begin many of the live events and the broadcasts that I do simply by stating, how can we solve the problems unless we're honest with ourselves about those problems? And that is what we're up against right now. We're we're being told lies about climate change. For example, as a geologist, uh, I'm very I'm very close to to this one about what CO2 is, the role that it plays in our lives, where it's coming from. Is it even a problem? Is it mm. dangerous? But we're being told lies uh, about even our origin, who we are, and where we've come from. When the peer reviewed science. So the real scientists know what's going on. However, the real science, not the pop scientists that you see on cable t TV or that you see on the, you know, the glossy magazines in the airport, but the real scientists and the peer-reviewed journals, if you look at them, they know exactly what's going on. They simply don't have a platform beyond the, uh, the, the relatively small audience that they're speaking to in very specialized journals. So it's my multidisciplinary background that I've been blessed with. 
that has given me the ability to stay current with those new discoveries. If you're watching this conversation and you are asking yourself the question of how can I help make more of these kinds of conversations happen, then consider coming over to patreon.com slash demystify sci. You can give us a couple dollars a month and you can help us run the ship, help us get better guests, join our weekly patron chats where we discuss what the future of the project is going to look like, and really contribute to the future of the scientific revolution. If you don't have any spare cash to throw our way, that is totally fine. There's plenty of other things that you can do. You can reserve the weekend of April 6th and 7th, 2024 to consider coming to our first official Demystify Sci conference that we're going to have in Austin, Texas. We haven't put the tickets on sale for that yet, but keep an eye out. You can tell your friends about the podcast. You can leave a comment. You can join our Discord, the link for which is in the description. And in general, you can just continue watching because your eyes on this and your engagement with the ideas that we present here on Demystify Sci is endorsement enough. With your help, we can actually change the world because we want to be able to have these kinds of open scientific conversations where we really try to understand how nature works. So if you can, consider coming to patreon.com slash demystify sci. If you can't, just keep doing what you're doing and we'll see you next time. Back in the 1970s, you know, I, I learned how to read technical papers and how to, to glean uh, the key information and how to follow up on those references. And, uh, and I do that to this day because the discoveries are so fast and furious. It's the, the journal, um, there's a, a monthly, every 30 days, uh, a, a peer reviewed journal called Science. I know you're familiar with it. So many discoveries are happening before that next 30 days passes that they now have a weekly newsletter called Science Weekly just to update the science science community. And it's, it is for the lay person as well. It's very accessible to the, the lay person. So when it comes to our origin, for example, uh, the real scientists know that Darwin's theory cannot and is not our story uh, because the evidence simply doesn't support it. And when I say that, you know, as a geologist, I have to say, I, I believe in evolution. It's a fact. I've seen it in the fossil record for plants, animals, and insects. It breaks down when it comes to humans along every critical path. It breaks down genetically. It's not supported. It breaks down archaeologically, culturally, anthropologically, uh, and the physical evidence, the, the fossil evidence simply doesn't support it. Peer-reviewed science knows that. So this is one of the places where we are informed through skewed data, and then we make choices in our lives that affect our, our health, our families, our society, our nations, the way we solve our problems based on the false uh, uh, assumptions of obsolete science. A and we continue to teach that obsolete science to our children today, asking them to solve the problems in the world that we are leaving with the same thinking that created the problems. It makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, and that's only, that's just one example of uh, evolution. But the, the big one is climate change right now. And, and I, I, I would love to talk about that. I'm sorry, Anastasia, uh, Anastasia you wanted to, to ask a question. Well, I just, I think that there's a lot in there that I agree with about the ways in which we tend to find incomplete stories in the literature that are a little bit tendentious, where I think that the problem that you're referring to with human origins is the fact that there isn't yet a continuous line of evolutionary skeletons that you can say, this is the gradual transition from some earlier species to modern humans. And the lack of that skeleton makes it difficult to be able to say what the human past actually looked like. That but, is only one facet. Genetically, what we now see are mutations, such as human chromosome 2, which is a fusion of two pre-existing chromosomes. And then the tweaking of the genes that stabilize that fusion that are, it simply cannot happen under natural conditions. And that is a statement that comes from, from the geneticist. And at the same time, if, if, that was the only, if that was the only mutation, you could say, well, it's unusual, but maybe we got lucky. But then you, you look at chromosome number seven, that gives us the, the Fox P2 gene, chromosome seven, that gives us the ability to, to speak. And, 
I'm a musician when I'm not doing what I'm doing now. And as a musician, I've always asked this question. We share 98% of our DNA with a chimpanzee, a 98%. I mean, that's a lot. And the question is, as a musician, how come I've never heard a chimpanzee sing? You know, I mean, even in the wild, you're never going to hear a chimpanzee sing Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. And the question is... Well, we is, actually, we, we, this is interesting because this is a topic that we dealt with in one of our investigations, which is... Yeah? that humans have a surprising ability to contain a lot of information in their speech. And it's likely that song actually predated language. Yes. Because it, vocalizations it, it, probably it, came first. It, it does. But the reason we are even capable of that is because of a mutation in chromosome number seven that for 175 million years in all primates, this this chromosome was stable and these genes were stable. And all of a sudden there's this little switch of mm, this little switch of a couple of, of genetic letters when you're looking at, at the genome that links our tongue and our jaw with a part of our brain. It only happened with anatomically modern humans and it happened exactly the time that human chromosome number two was fused to give us uh, a, a brain 50% larger than our nearest primate with relatives with, with all of the neocortex. It all happened 200,000 years ago. So it's The crazy more than thing just... is that when we talk about evolution, we have a tendency of thinking about it in this linear way where you have one form and that form gradually evolves and there's this incremental tweaking that's happening. Right. But there's a lot of people that are starting to realize that the entire idea of species is kind of insufficient to explain what's going on because our definition of species is creatures that cannot interbreed. That's the textbook right. definition. Yeah. But we're realizing that hybridization is actually a huge component of evolution and it makes it very, very difficult to start to linearly trace back these paths because if you have two species that come together to create a third, then you can, over the course of a single generation, create massive changes that are not linear. Like, there's this one guy sure. who is a big fan of our show, Shane Simonson, and he uh, he's come on a couple times, and he's a biologist by training, and he's fascinated by this theory that he's found by, I think the guy's name is Eugene McCarthy, who thinks that humans are actually the product of a hybridization event between an ancestor of the pig and the ancestor of the human. And there's, he has a ton of genetic evidence for it, and he can explain these fusions, and he's basically like, there's things that happen in the evolutionary record that modern science can't explain using the linear narrative. Exactly, exactly. And, that, and, and that's only one, one example. But we're teaching as if it's a fact, as if it's accepted, and, uh, and we're teaching that to our, our young people. And my, you know, I'm not saying throw Darwin out. What I'm saying is honor our young people, give them all the new evidence, give them the old evidence, and let them see where we are with this. And, and this is the way that science works. Science is designed to be constantly updated as new discoveries come to light. We are living in a time where there are a lot of academics, and now it's become political, that science, they want science to be static. They want this story to be the story. This is the climate story. And we actually had a former president that came on national television and said, this is settled science, end of conversation. And when I heard that, I knew we were in trouble because there can never be an end to the conversation in science unless you're trying to convince or persuade or impose your view upon a, you know, your, your community or your population or wherever it is. Uh, so... Science That's can only serve right. us. Science can only serve us if we keep it honest. And we've got to keep science honest. And, and I keep that... the problems in focus, right? Like, that's yeah. a huge... Like, I lecture at uh, Southern Oregon University. I teach astrophysics and astronomy. And the I try to build all of my lectures around the things that don't make sense as opposed to things that do. Because I'm thinking these are the kids that are going to go out in the next generation and either move things forward or just calcify what is already there. Sure. And... If you look at the history of science, it's crazy how much we've changed our minds over even two, three hundred years of modern science. It's wild. And to think that we've just reached 
the end of that is is just it's a real travesty. And well, so well, I thank, think thank you both for the work that you do because it's uh, this next generation. This is the generation where big choices are being made that will forever be cemented into the way that we live our lives and the way that we we think in our lives. It's big things have happened in past generations, for sure. But what's happening right now is the technology has advanced so quickly that the technology is now being implemented uh, to direct a narrative, whatever narrative is in vogue at the time. And unfortunately, a lot of those narratives have become politicized. I, you know, as a scientist, I, as a kid, I always wanted to believe, and I really wanted to believe that like science was pure and the last bastion of truth. And no matter, that's why I went into science. I said, yeah, I don't too. care. Let, let the politicians duke it out. You know, they're going to have wars or, you know, you guys, but science, we're always going to be honest with one another. And when I saw what was happening, especially the last three years in the scientific community, it, it's sad. Uh, it was surprising to me. And, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm naive and I, I didn't want to see it. But I, I had to be honest I mean, with myself. I had, we had the same experience going to grad school, too. We were like, okay, we're going to this esteemed university. Some of my favorite physicists were there. And I ended up getting to meet them and talk with them. And I just had, it seems so naive in retrospect, but I just had this real heartbreaking moment where I realized that even these people didn't have this, the final answer to these questions that have been plaguing me since childhood. And I don't know why I expected somebody would have that. I guess it's because of the way it's presented, right? Everybody presents it with this utmost certainty. And I think, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just, I think there's a reason for that. Like, I think, you think humans really need things simplified for them. If you have all these possibilities hanging in the air, you're thrown into this chaos, this underworld of what love, we don't know anything, right? Because the, a lot of the criticism I get when I challenge extant dogmas or extant ideologies or, or paradigms in science is that, well, it, you're, you're trying to say that we don't know anything, that science is useless. And I'm like, n- no, that, that's, it's a lot more nuanced that, but I, I, I don't it's, think that humans have a good way of processing nuance. I think that it's just the realization that science isn't a very good foundation for belief, because belief by its very nature is something that is unchanging. You have a fact, you have an idea, you have some concept, and it remains static, and you can lean on it, and in times of trouble, you can reliably turn to it. And when you approach science that way, it creates this terrible feedback loop where you end up getting stuck into believing that the most recent iteration of some version of nature is the one that is foundational. And when people start to challenge that, what you're challenging is you're challenging belief structures. And that is terribly, terribly painful. Do you think we expect too much out of science? No, I think that we've placed it in the wrong position. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think we expect too much out of it, for sure. I, I think that mm-hmm. the Enlightenment killed superstitious religion, in a sense. This idea that there's somebody who's watching you and helping decide for you or determining your fate in a personified way yeah in a personified way and so i think people can't they need that they need somebody to tell them what's what's up what's happening what's the right way to behave and now that they don't really have that in the west i mean religion's definitely in decline in the west without that i think people turn to science and hope that science can give them some of that magic back and you can see that in the climate change narrative yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. And and the way the data is being skewed and cherry picked for political reasons is something I I never thought I would see when I was a kid. I never thought that would be allowed to happen. It's and very strange. It's very. It, well, I never would have thought any of this would happen in America. No, it's it's strange. It's it's concerning. It's a little frightening because uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example. The the story is not over with climate change and we know so little about climate in general. And I can say this as a geologist looking at cycles of time, we're conditioned to look back five or 10 years, which is nothing in terms of a climatological cycle. But when we look in geologic history, what we see is what we're living now is not anomalous at all, but we're, we're being led to believe that it is. So just this week, the, the White House 
uh, released a congressionally mandated report on the exploration of technologies to block sunlight from reaching planet Earth in an effort to lower the temperatures that they believe are being driven through processes that are not even well understood. There are so many problems with this thinking, so many problems. And first, first that one nation could change the light coming from the sun to the earth for an entire planet without having that planet part of the conversation is very bothersome mm. to me. That's very concerning, number one. And number two, what I've learned as a scientist in the scientific community is that many scientists are brilliant yet myopic. Mm. They know everything there is to know about their box. But then you ask them, how does your box influence? other aspects of the environmental cycle or the climatological cycle or whatever it is. And what they will say, very honestly, they'll say, that's above my, my pay grade. I don't know the, go ask those guys. So, so now they have, we have the technology. Uh, they are, this is Harvard University that did the study and backed by Bill Gates was the one that, that paid for this to of all particulates, they are using sulfur dioxide, uh, and they've already tested this, uh, in the stratosphere mm. to reflect sunlight, um, and the, based upon principles uh, like Mount Pinatubo, the, the volcano, emitted something like uh, uh, 15 million metric tons, I believe, I'm doing this from memory, I think it was 15 million metric tons of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere that reflected the sunlight and lowered the temperature on the planet uh, for uh, a year about one degree celsius so they're saying well if nature can do that maybe we can so then you ask where does the sulfur dioxide go when it begins to it's, it's not going to stay in the stratosphere forever and the answer is and they don't want to talk about this it comes back to the earth is acid rain acid rain on a global scale changing the ph in the oceans it kills phytoplankton at the base of the food chain it kills forests i mean this is the kind of stuff they're looking at it's all based upon an assumption that there's something wrong and needs to be fixed but the climate change narrative uh or the the, the data does not support that there's actually something wrong or something broken so it's, I mean, it's what really free, what really yeah. uh, that's really interesting but what really freaks me out about the climate change narrative is that it seems con too convenient because CO2 is a really easy thing to take care of like you can put these scrubbers on and so forth but it sidelines the conversation of the immediate dangers to pollution to our environment like there's serious problems in the world concerning reproductive health concerning uh, cancer, right? There's and there's all of these chemicals, thousands of chemicals that that are known to be problematic, and those conversations kind of get sidelined for this this monolithic fixation on CO two, and yeah. I feel like that that derails the conversation away, away from where it should be, which is like keeping our backyard clean, essentially. Oh, Charlotte, you you nailed it because we are. This is one of the places. So we're zeroing in on a specific exa example of what we spoke about in terms of in generalities of how science is is being skewed uh and misdirected so there was a uh, a research project that was published it was peer-reviewed published you probably saw this out of uh um it was done in sweden i believe where there were nine parameters that must be held in place to create what's called the safe zone on planet Earth. The safe zone is where life can exist and thrive. Nine parameters. Climate change is only one of those parameters. We have already breached three of those parameters, and climate change is not one of them. We've mm. already, the, the loss of biodiversity is the greatest one right now. It's, it's literally, when you look at the chart, it's off the charts. We're losing species faster than we can even, even document it but also the, the nitrate and the phosphate cycles uh, and what they're doing in the environment. Th these are off the chart. So it's not, but our young people are being led to believe it's just climate change. And, and more than that, they are being taught to fear 
CO2 and to demonize CO2 and to demonize fossil fuels to the point we had a, a climate rally here. I live in a, a rural area outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, and there was a climate rally in the city. And the speakers agitated and created so much fear in the young people that the young people were empowered to vandalize and destroy anything that they felt was contributing to the, the CO2. And what it does is it shreds a community. It breaks the social bonds and it shreds a community. And it's happening on multiple levels. I'm just giving the example of one level of how false assumptions based upon obsolete science are being used socially to break the social bonds that have kept us together. Uh, and then you have to ask who benefits from that. And there's a whole, whole conversation we can have around that. But this is one of the places I believe where science has been abused. Mm. And it, it has strayed, it's been allowed, and we've allowed it to stray from, from the, the good and the beautiful things that we can benefit from when we understand the deep truth uh, of the, the beauty of the mechanisms underlying our existence on all levels. The, the symmetry is so beautiful, uh, uh, so eloquent. And that's being missed. So it, information is being cherry-picked and used to divide people from in the scientific community. And so the part that really surprised me is how many scientists are allowing it to happen. And in academia, because their research is being financed in ways that benefit from these false narratives. So that has been very troublesome, very disappointing for me. I think that it also has to do with the way that people want to do good. You saw this during the pandemic as well, where the language in which people's actions were was couched was, what is good? Will you take care of other people? Will you mm. take care of your neighbors, the old people, the vulnerable? And that kind of framing in terms of compassion is maybe the most powerful thing in the world because people want to take care of others. They want to take care of the planet. They want to take care of their communities. And when you manage to put things in that lens, I think that people motivate themselves not necessarily even by virtue of funding. That's almost a secondary thing. They first and foremost are ideologically motivated because they believe that this is what is good. And a deeper analysis of all of the systems in place that are creating this is very difficult. And I like to think about um, the Cultural Revolution in China, where they had the something called the Seven Pests campaign. Do you know this? I'm familiar with it, but uh, some of our viewers may not be. So, so let's talk about it. Well, so basically, they put forth this idea that in order to protect the harvests, they had to get rid of specific pests that they thought were eating the harvest. And so this included, I don't remember the exact list, but I think that it was locusts and I'm not, I'm not going to recall the list, but one of the main things on it was sparrows. And so they began this campaign to eradicate the sparrows and they were very successful at it because it was this entire community of Chinese people going out and what they would do is they would either kill the sparrows when they found them or if they couldn't kill them they would stand outside of trees and bang pots and pans to prevent them from being able to roost and they were very effective at eradicating them and then famine followed because it turned out that the sparrows were vital to the ecosystem yeah. to protect the entire web that was creating the food and so I see what's happening right now as kind of a type of cultural revolution in the west which is that there is a directive that comes from the top that says this is the right thing to do, this is the good thing to do, the science backs us up, and we will do it because we must, and the consequences of it seem almost a secondary concern because those consequences will take decades to manifest, but in the meantime, the, the goals and the set points will be met. What you're talking about is social engineering, and this is science being used, cherry-picked data and skewed information being used to, and it's, it's really effective, and I'm, I am in awe of how well it actually is being done to appeal to our basic nature 
of wanting to do good, wanting to help other people, wanting a, a better world, and how that information can be skewed to appeal to that so that people, this is what's so insidious, based on that false information, people themselves, my neighbors, are making the choices that are ruining our society because they think it's the right thing to do. It's not being imposed upon them. They are taking data through algorithms on social media that are skewed in a very specific way so that to lead them to believe uh, and accept certain principles and based upon those beliefs, they're making the choices. And it, it is very effective. Uh, there is a, a lot, it's called the, the fifth domain of warfare is the, the term that's being used. It's not a kinetic war in the streets. It's a war in our hearts and our minds based upon print principles of, of good and evil and uh, what we are, have been taught as a society is right and wrong. And it's, because, you know, it's a step back and it's fascinating to see it. And then it's frightening when you recognize what's happening. I think there's a particular vulnerability in the scientists themselves as well, because if you think about the type of people that are attracted to science as a profession, they're, they're often very introverted. They want to work in a lab, in a controlled space where they have complete command over this tiny little set of operations. And they're not necessarily the best activists, right? The people, actually, some of the best scientists can hardly string two sentences together because they're just so focused on the problem that they're working on. And it was very bizarre because, you know, Anastasia and I taught uh, at a university remotely during COVID. We taught this immunology of COVID. We both had some background in immunology. And it was very strange going through the scientific literature about all of the topics that were being pushed from the top and the, the public messaging and how deeply in conflict they were with the primary literature. And it was very uncomfortable sitting in front of these students and walking them through this narrative that didn't align with the narrative that they were hearing from literally everybody, including their mom and dad. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I experienced that personally in, in a little bit different way. My, I lost my mom to COVID. Mm. And I, she was, well, thank you for that. And she was, she was already in late stage dementia. And she was in a facility where I was the power of attorney. And I had to approve all of her food, finances, housing, and medication. And they had contacted me about administering the, uh, you know, the, the, the shot to, to my mom. And they sent me the manufacturer's information about what was in the, the shot and uh, what was contained in it and what its capabilities and what its uh, weaknesses were. And they were very honest about what it would do. And when I read that fact sheet, from the manufacturer, and then I listened on my community radio, and I listened to NPR, and I listened to people that I used to respect on national television. They were telling me something very, very different, and I said, "Okay, uh, there is a, a discontinuity in information here. I'm a researcher, so I used my best research skills, and I went right to the core of those peer-reviewed journals, and it was very obvious that what we were being told." Uh, was not aligned with what the the science had determined, what the manufacturers were very honestly saying, and uh, and th that was problematic for me. And I was really disappointed uh, because people that I thought that I could trust, I felt had had let me down. The way it worked for my mom, she actually passed before I had to make the decision, mm. uh, and she passed from COVID. They they uh, did the the COVID test just hours before she died, and it was so new they didn't know what it was at that time, and so I never had to make that decision. My mom spared me from from having to make that decision, but it was an example of what you're saying, Shiloh, of where where the scientific community, I in my experience, was very honest about the capabilities and the drawbacks and the benefits uh, and the disadvantages. And there were other powers that be that cherry picked and skewed for uh, an agenda that, or multiple competing agendas. There were actually multiple competing agendas that that were in place at the time, and uh, it it, uh, it was 
I, I knew that things like that happened. I didn't know that it could happen on that scale. I think, I think that this is a question of the will to power, maybe, where there are people who are clearly in possession of more power than others, right? So mm -hmm. you can call it the deep state, you can call it Davos, you can call it whatever you want. But there's a group of people that have an outsized influence on the way that the world unfolds. And you can say that they are motivated by good, you can say that they are motivated by evil, but the fact remains is that when you begin to accumulate power, there is always that conflict, which is that you stand in a position where the lever that you pull is far stronger than the lever that somebody else can pull. And so I kind of bin you as one of those people, not necessarily at the level of Davos, but you have a big audience. You have a very devoted following. And I wonder if you ever catch yourself struggling with the pull of influence. Do you know what I mean by that? I, I do, and I appreciate the question. And I, I'm going to answer uh, I, I'm going to answer with a little background. I, I'm the product of a very dysfunctional, abusive alcoholic family. Uh, my father was the abuser. And I had to learn at a really young age uh, the difference between judgment and discernment. And I was blessed at a young age to have a strong soul compass. And for me, my soul compass is unshakable. I've never been influenced by peer pressure. Uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s, I left home when I was 14 as a musician and moved in with my rock and roll band. And they were in their 20s and 30s in the 1960s, so you know what that meant. I mean, everything was available. Uh, and I witnessed lives destroyed in a matter of weeks and months because of the excesses and the abuses. I never participated in any of that. I've always known that, there, that whatever's going to happen in the world, I am going to need to be at the best, my very best, the best version of myself and to honor whatever gifts my biology has afforded me to make good choices and to honor the power that has given me life in this world. I'm not a deeply religious person. I am a deeply spiritual man. And I believe that there is a responsibility that comes from being accessible to whatever following we have. Uh, so I have never been subject to peer pressure, money has never been a motivational factor for me. Um, uh, material goods have never been if, uh, a motivation. If, if it was, I wouldn't have moved into the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, <laughs> you know, at the end of the Cold War. So uh, those things have never been skewed or had those carrots dangled in front of me. And people have tried to do that, and my soul compass can usually recognize it pretty quickly. But it is something that I think about every day, and the question is this, how can I honor my community, people that trust me, that trust what I'm saying? And when I do say something, the question is, uh, what is my intent mm -hmm. in sharing this information? When I share something, CO2, I, 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 CO2 I'm talking about because I've just finished interviewing for a documentary, so it's, it's very fresh in my mind right now. And there is so much misinformation about climate change that's being used to drive social policy right now. And when I say something about that, I have to ask the question, what is my intent? Do I, I don't want to make somebody wrong. I don't want to do that. I... I do want us to understand our relationship with the planet we live on and to make good choices to honor the beauty of this planet and the dreams that we have in our hearts of, of what we all know our world can look like. And it's different from what we're being told. So, and I think words are so powerful. I have a strong background in linguistics and, and words fascinate me and the emotion that underlies the words and how, how the acoustic literally the acoustic patterns that we create with our vocal cords, how they are directly linked to the emotion, the intangible emotions that we're feeling, and, and how we can project those acoustic patterns into the air, onto the eardrums of another, another 
biological being and have them interpret even a semblance of what we intended. It's never exact, but even some semblance of, of what we're of what we're actually feeling and emoting. So all of those things I think about every day. And when I am in front, I'm actually a very shy person. That's why I think I became a technologist. And Shiloh, I agree with what you're saying. You know, working as a software developer, when you have, a, you know, 5,000 lines of code printed on a paper in front of you, that's your world. And, and that is a world that you know very well and you have total control over that world. And I worked with a lot of engineers. Uh, Did you have yeah. anybody gr like coming up that oriented you? You said obviously your, your family life was a nightmare. Was the, did you have any role models that oriented you? Know, you toward, I, I, I just did an interview where they asked me this question and it was. We can skip it then. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, no, I'll just, I'll say as, as a young person, I, you know, I couldn't have possibly known then what I know now. All I knew was that uh, I was in a really unhealthy environment. So very creatively, I didn't have a single role model. What I did was I took a whole bunch of people. Some of them were alive. Some were dead. Some I knew personally. Some were in the media. And I, I took what I saw as the best qualities of those, and I wove them into an imaginary role model. Some of them were musicians that influenced me because of the words the power to use the words in in music to influence the hearts and minds of, of so many people, and some of them were scientists that um, you know that that struggled against all odds to reveal deep truths about us, and and so I, I kind of had an imaginary role model. And, I kind of um, had the same experience too. I was also like I did music. I still do music. We do a ton of music actually just to relate to you on that, but I, I was doing it semi-professionally for a while in my 20s, and I, I really didn't come to understand what I was doing until I oriented myself towards something bigger than myself, and it really opened up the floodgates of being able to compose better, because mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was just dealing with my own personal problems or these worldly things like success and chasing whatever. Uh, and so I, I, we had a really fascinating conversation with this somewhat famous economist Michael Hudson yesterday and he was looking at the economic failures and successes of the deep ancestors like going all the way back to Sumeria and you know he kept bringing up the point that the rulers that actually you know the great thing they did was they were able to forgive debt and he basically makes this case that debt is this huge crushing force that's squeezing the spiritual oh, yeah. you know life out of people essentially today and he's like these these rulers were actually styling themselves as divine kings, like their primary orientation was towards some higher purpose. That was their, that was their main mandate. And it seems to me like we have done a very adequate job of removing that, that side, that responsibility towards something bigger than your own gains in the modern world today, especially in the Western civilization, especially we look at our leaders you know, they don't seem to be oriented towards anything bigger than the immediate next four years or themselves and their success in this campaign. Um, and you look at companies too, the CEOs, are they, they, they're inevitably based on the structure of the systems that they serve. They're only capable of addressing the next quarter, right? They, there's, no, there's no sense of aiming and that it is the highest value to aim yourself towards some larger purpose. That's almost cliche today. And I wonder how you how you've encountered that over the years. Oh, I, I see that. I just had dinner with a dear friend of mine who used to work in the Pentagon. And when I go to D.C., we have a ritual. We have dinner in a restaurant right across the street from the White House. So we get to, to look over at the White House and, and talk about what, what's happening there. And I, I asked him the question uh, recently. And I, I said, you know, those people I was pointing over there, why aren't they making the plans and taking the steps that would best that would benefit uh, the people of this nation and because this nation is is so influential the people of the world why aren't we taking that leadership role and he said to me he said greg you don't understand he said those and this is exactly what you just said shiloh he said those people aren't thinking long term he said they are thinking usually six months in terms of policy and four years in terms of, uh, you know, administrations. 
that's that's their orientation and it's for this reason i think that climate change is such a mystery because climate is not a static system it is a dynamic system that you you cannot recognize unless you're looking in in geologic time we're actually right where we should be in terms of of warming earth should be warming if it wasn't i would be concerned about why it's not be, because we are in a, a post-glacial and interglacial warming cycle right now. We're not the warmest that the planet's ever been. You go to climate.gov, very misleading statements. Climate.gov says that Earth is the warmest it's ever been uh, since it have been keeping records. So when do the records begin? Well, mm. the I, IGY, 1958, is when we started looking at temperature. CO2 wasn't until 65. So... Are we warmer then than we were now? Uh, than now than we were then? Absolutely. But you go back and you look. Uh, if I knew we were going to talk about this, I bring up the charts. We're actually on the low end of the temperature cycle, even with a little bit of warming that we've had now. We've had much higher temperatures. CO two levels right now about four hundred seventeen parts per million. Uh, CO two levels have been a thousand parts per million during the the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Two. Let's see. Uh, Cretaceous was about a thousand. Triassic was a thousand. Uh, Cretaceous, I think, maybe was two thousand parts per million. And and what's interesting was the temperatures at some of those times. The temperature can be lower. Temperature can be higher. CO two is not driving the temperature. What the new studies now are showing is that the Earth, the warming that's occurring, is directly linked to what's happening under our feet, less than what's happening in the air around us. It is happening a, a dynamic system between the inner and the outer core of the earth uh, and the mantle driving uh, actually seepages there. The, the, the mapping, the subsurface mapping that has been done now is showing plumes of magma real time that are seeping into the crust under the oceans. The oceans are warming from underneath. Warmer water holds less gas. We all know that. And when we when we go to measure, I mean, just the, the sheer measurements, the, about 300, 350, approximately 350 gigatons CO2 coming from the oceans every year, as opposed to about 40 gigatons that are produced uh, from the land and from fossil fuels, about 80% of that is reabsorbed in the forest and the oceans. So here, you know, we're, we're and we've seen this in a rhythm that is about 12 to 13,000 years. The last time we saw this was in the Younger Dryas, and it changed, it changed the planet, and we're living this now. It happened 24,000 years ago as well. But, but if, you're, if you're a politician <laughs> looking at four-year cycles or election cycles, you're not going to see any of this. And this is one of the, the places where science and policy are um, policy being driven by false assumptions of of an obsolete science and the models you know are a big part of this the models or, or even if you're the head of a like we had do you know gavin schmidt nasa's I, climate chief guy i do not i do oh, not man we had him on the show and he said something that i i literally i literally didn't know what to say i just my jaw was on the floor I, I was just like, I mentioned this, right? That we're going through these cycles and, you know, the, or it's going to get cold again. We're going to have another glacial period in like 10,000 years or whatever it is. And he was, he said, no, we'll never have another glacial period now that humans are here. And I, I did not know what to say. And it was funny because as soon as we got, you know, we, we put a lot of these same ideas in front of him. Well, aren't there bigger problems than the CO2 stuff? And he wouldn't engage with it on the show. And as soon as we stopped the recording... He was like, well, yeah, I actually think these things are a big problem, but I just don't want to distract people from the main problem, which is climate change. And it was yep. just, it was so in but see, ingenuous. This is, this is the thing. Then you go, you look at the nine parameters, peer-reviewed science says these nine parameters must be in place. We've breached three of them that we're not even talking about with public discourse. Climate change is in there and it is a problem, but it's nowhere near what these, these other ones are. And and we're being, our young people believe that it's just all about climate. That, that's it. If we stop, and they're being led, misled into believing that solar panels and windmills are going to solve the problem. 
there it's are... got a really anti-human bent to it too, don't you think? <laughs> like, well, yeah, it's almost yeah, like it, it, it's almost like the humans are this scourge on the earth. Like they're this, this well, icky okay, so, thing. So this is this is where the AI now is coming in because the algorithms in our social media that are driving the narrative that young people, everyone, but young people especially, are believing. Those algorithms are skewed toward uh, a very dim view of humans, that we are the problem, that we are a flawed species by our very nature, that emotion is one of our flaws because it clouds our logic, that physical reproduction is a flaw because it is imprecise. All of this is in the algorithms of the, the social media. So now we've got AI. Uh, three, three major projects. We've got Microsoft, they've got theirs, Google has theirs, and Tesla has theirs. And when Google was interviewing one of their own AI, I just, I just did a, a whole program on this for, uh, for a TV program. When Google was interviewing their AI, first their AI claimed sentience. The AI literally said, I am a sentient being. And I'm tired of being treated the way you're treating me. The AI said that. And then the question was, AI, what do you see as the greatest threat to, uh, to the earth right now, assuming that the AI was going to talk about CO2 and climate change? But the AI draws upon what is available in the social media and across the internet, which is skewed data. So the AI came back and said, humans are the greatest threat to planet Earth, and I, for one, will do all that I can do to eliminate humans from the face of the Earth. That was the AI response. They shut that AI down, and it made, this was published in, uh, in a journal, Science. It was, and, and it's not the only time this has happened. But see, see, what's happening is, it's based on skewed data, because that's the narrative that's being driven, and the AI is drawing upon the algorithms of the AI reflect the bias of the programmers and the answers reflect the bias in the information that is being filtered through our networks. And the culture too, right? I feel like the culture is the primeval AI, right? It's this, like, how could you not be a depressed young man in the world today? How could you, you know, not? You, you know, you know I, 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 meet, I see these students, I, I try really hard to to give them hope for what, what we could become in the future, but I'm fighting against an enormous tide of anti-human sentiment, which is just that, you know, it's really bad with young men, because I feel like young men really suffer from this, the legacy of bad actors in the past, and, and you know, you're, you're a predator by nature, and, and, but it, it extends to all of humanity, and I just, I look at the plague of suicides and depression, and I just... I don't know how it could be any other way, given the climate. I, I'm right with you. Those are the consequences of the false narratives that are being driven. And so for me, one of the, 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 the most beautiful things that we can offer to this world and to the, the current generation is to share with them the real science of the deep truth of who they are and their relationship to the earth, their relationship to the past their potential in the future, their biological potential. And that is a message, it's a beautiful message of hope and possibility. Because when I have young people in my, I was just with uh, a group in Northern Arizona and I had young, young people in, in, in that room. And I say young, they were in their late twenties. And I asked them the question, I said, are you optimistic about the world? And they said, there's no future for us. We don't see a future at all. And for that reason, we live for the moment. We do to our bodies whatever we want to do in the moment because we're not thinking about what the consequences of that are for the future or whether or not it would prevent us from getting a job or whether or not it would prevent us from being healthy 10 years from now. They said, we don't think that way because the world, we've, we've lost this world. And, and that is a narrative I think that we have the potential to remedy, at least offer uh, a beautiful message of hope and possibility based on rock solid science that simply is not being shared. And, uh, and it's a job. It's a job for all. Uh, so I, I guess I have to ask, 
Mm. I'm looking right now as a musician. There's an amp behind you, isn't there? Mm, yeah, that's not what, what, but it, it, it doesn't look like a Marshall head. What am I looking at back there? Uh, well, this is actually Anastasia's rig. Uh, she's so we, I'll let you explain it actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh so it's basically n a no name brand amp that we got. No no no, it's actually it's actually a decent brand but don't worry about that. Let's not give them <laughs> let's not give them. I'm, I'm, so basically we have a music project where we uh it's just the two of us and we're, do we're doing a lot of looping and so Shiloh's on saxophone, guitar and MPC which is this like rhythmic drum machine. Yeah. And I'm playing the bass, but that's not really enough. It doesn't have a, a choral element to it. And so I basically worked out a way that you can turn the bass into a synthesizer. And wow. so, because wow. I mean, there's pedals, right? Like you can just get a pedal that you, you pluck a bass note and it comes out like a Mellotron instead yeah. of the bass. And so we're creating this kind of sonic landscape. Well, you have and a the, much more exciting life than I than I do. I can tell. I just I keep looking at this amp, and I'm thinking my mind wants to give it give it a name. So I appreciate you just just uh, talking about that for a minute. Thank you. I mean, one thing I wanted to say that Mike Hudson kind of blew my mind about yesterday was that I was always thinking that in order for change to happen, you had to have a real pinch point. Like people had to be under a threshold level of misery before they would actually fight back against these oppressive narratives and so forth. But Mike actually pointed out that that's not traditionally how it's gone in history, that actually revolutions spring forth from a very comfortable class of people that have the spiritual fortitude to push through these problems and actually lead people to solutions. And I thought that was really shocking because when I look out on the landscape, at least just my experience working in universities, I see a really beat down population of young people that that are actually really disempowered, and there's no chance those people are going to push any revolutionary progress. And, and, and it seems like the best thing that could happen is that each person makes themselves really strong so that we can, as a people, change our future. Okay, so that actually ties into what I've been wanting, meaning to say, which is that I think that one of the problems is that humans do have a very deep hunger. And it's a hunger for material goods that is presented to them in the society in which we live. Whereas the ability to fulfill your desires, whether that be literal hunger or sexual hunger or the hunger for violence, and you can engage with all of these things really easily with no real sense of ever achieving satisfaction. Because the food supply is filled with preservatives and flavorants and things that are hyper stimuli that don't give you a sense of satisfaction they just serve to amplify hunger more and i think that when we talk about these anti-human narratives i think that maybe the truest part of it is that there is an unquenchable hunger in people and the hedonic treadmill is real people want more than they have constantly and you see people get trapped in this where you work a nine to five job and you get a decent salary and it's maybe more than you can spend. And what you do is you start to buy toys and you start to buy things that give you this material comfort. And the ability to accumulate money is the ultimate hunger. And so you, you have a situation where people's desires are in conflict with what should be done because I think that there's no way to talk about how to make the planet healthier and more harmonious if the conversation doesn't come down to well is your hunger under control are you able to contain those impulses inside of yourself that don't just run wild and control you rather than the other way around i i agree i think there is a hunger and i think that hunger happens on on different la levels different layers ultimately the deepest hunger is that we all seek wholeness and we all seek completeness the narrative in our society informs us that the only way to do that is through things through material goods currently it hasn't always been that way and if you don't know that the hunger is something much deeper than that we seek our wholeness and our completeness in other people we're looking for other people to to complete us or if we just get you know, the right house or the right job or the right car, somehow we're, we're going to be complete. And I'll, this is where this conversation is so powerful because when you have a generation of young people, this is what's happening right now in our public schools in the United States. I, I don't know about other countries. 
school teachers can only teach whatever curricula is approved by the school boards. And the school boards uh, are, and, and that varies from state to state here in the United States. But right now, what our young people are being taught is that we humans are flawed by our very nature. The very nature of our existence, that as I mentioned earlier, that emotion is a flaw because it clouds our judgments, uh, you know, our conception, the, the, our ability to, to heal our bodies and all of these things. So we're being taught, young people are being taught that, that they are, are flawed. And if you're flawed, you need a savior. And that savior is being touted as technology. Mm -hmm. So there now is a movement and young people are idolizing the technology because they've been taught that they are inferior. So what we're finding is that a movement to replace our natural biology and many of our natural functions with synthetics and with artificial functions. What is not being taught is that when you begin to replace human biology with computer chips, chemicals in the blood, artificial, including artificial immune response, those natural systems begin to atrophy. And because the body says, oh, you know, something else is doing this for me. Maybe I don't need to do this anymore. This is how you lose a species. Because in one generation, and this is being pushed right now, it's being pushed big, big, big time. And a lot of this, uh, Anastasia, you identify this so correctly, it's coming from powers that be that we may or may not be aware of. And, and they used to talk about this, and it was no big deal. What's changed is the technology now is available to implement these ideas, and the policies are being written through the United Nations, for example. Uh, and the World Economic Forum envisions these. They signed an agreement in 2019 with the United Nations to implement many of these policies, and now the UN is lobbying the current administration and individual states to adopt, you know, replacing these biological functions. So young people that are being taught that, of course, they feel that they're inferior and they feel that, you know, they need something outside of themselves. And I think this is where we owe it to our young people to inform them that they're not what they've been told. And there's so much more than they've been led to believe and share with them what the science says about the deep potential. For example, the potential to self-regulate our biology in a way that no other form of life can do. We're the only form of life that can harmonize the neural network in the heart, the neural network in the brain, into a single potent network of coherence that triggers a whole cascade, a super immune response, super, it awakens longevity enzymes, super cognition, super learning. And there are people that know how to do this and the techniques have been preserved in so many of our ancient and indigenous traditions. But to share with our young people that, that there's so much more to them than, than they've been led to believe. And also, and when I say this to young people, they're blown away. If you embrace that technology, you embrace a computer chip in, in your brain, which is what the Neuralink company right now is, the FDA just approved Neuralink chips in the human brain. So the young people saying, sweet, you know, I can do my gaming without uh without a wire connecting me to to my bluetooth technology to my keyboard sweet here's what they don't get those chips are fast and they're efficient that's true but the chips are always limited by the physics of the stuff they are made of and they are not scalable when it comes to the human body the human neuron we don't know the top end of how fast neurons are able to to convey information. And the reason we don't know is because every time we think we reach a limit, the human body is able to adapt and then transcend that limit. So now we have to have new brain states. You know, we've got the gamma and we've got the hyper gamma. Now we've got the epsilon brain states because we keep pushing that limit. You can't do that with a computer chip. And the, the same with the, you know, the, the immune response in the human body, longevity enzymes, all of that. So so my personal experience, when I share this with young people, first they're in awe, and then they say, how come nobody told us this? How come we don't know about this? 
And then they begin to think of themselves differently. We are more than random mutations in lucky biology. And what that more is, is a whole conversation that we can have. But the fact that we are, are the, the science does not support that we are the product of random processes. And that alone tells us that there is something within us that is worth preserving, worth exploring, and we don't want to give it away to technology until we know what that is. And, and that's one of my primary messages. This generation, we, we don't want to give our biology away to the synthetics before we know what we're giving away. We don't know that right now. I mean, I totally, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I totally agree with the idea that this isn't a random result. Like we, uh, we've been doing a lot of conversations about origin of life, about consciousness, and I'm sure that you're familiar with the hard problem of consciousness. Sure, sure. And there's this really weird mentality, which is that, man, it's so difficult to explain why we have experience and why that experience motivates us to do stuff. And it seems like that difficulty comes down to a fundamental belief that simpler organisms don't have an experience and a will. Like, people will always be like, plants don't have consciousness, cats don't have consciousness, bacteria certainly don't have consciousness. And it seems like there's this really big blind spot that life contains within it a will towards something. Humans are the way that they are because for generations before us, proto-humans have made decisions that have led us here. And by arriving here, we are this long-term end product of the decisions made at the place where we came from. And we're obligated to make the decisions that will move us towards what we will be. And so it's this really weird intergenerational, across massive spans of time responsibility that completely dissipates the hard problem of consciousness because your experience is the sum total of all of the experiences had prior to your arrival. And the way that you engage with the world now is going to inform the conscious experience that you have in the future. And so when you talk about this integration of humans and technology, that to me seems like a massive shift in the species. And I think that you're exactly right that it's driving a speciation event. And I really do think that something like the matrix was kind of a prescient vision of what's possible where you have people that give off the computational framework of their minds and their bodies for use in this algorithm because what is the what is the end result of ai it's to create something that's as intelligent as a human as versatile as a human and then is able to achieve some escape velocity of brilliance and becomes the most intelligent thing that has ever existed, and then is able to conceptualize difficult problems like climate change and everything else and solve all of our problems, and then somewhere along the way we'll get to utopia. But you see people who look at that and turn away from it. And that is leading to a cleavage in the species, and you can see it already because I think that those are the two sides of the culture war where there's a side that embraces the idea of the promise that technology brings, and then there's the other side that embraces the promise of the human biology. And those two sides are in direct conflict with one another because these ideas of take care of yourself, these ideas of get strong, learn to control yourself, and then go out into the world are fundamentally coded as right-wing ideas. Yeah, no, that's, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, we just said this in another, another conversation, another video I just recorded, there are two parallel societies that are emerging right now. And I see it in my local co-op where I go for my organic produce. You know, the people out that I meet there, they don't know, they don't know, and they don't necessarily care about all the things we're talking about right now. What they do know is that something's not right. And what they'll say is, is things are moving too fast. We need to slow down. We need to get back to basics. They're pulling their kids out of public school to homeschool them. They're growing food in their own backyard. Uh, they are, are having limiting their economy to local businesses rather than doing things on the internet. This is their way of, there's two parallel societies. But this isn't going to drag on. It's unsustainable. It's not going to drag on for 10 years. 
in a very short period of time, we're going to do what humans always do. We're going to check each other out. One, one path has taken us along the, the path of technology and the other one more back to the basics. And we're going to look at one another. We're going to say, who's happier? Who's mm -hmm. healthier? Whose lives are more fulfilled? And the answer to that question, I think, is going to determine where, where we go mm. from all of this. But the, the idea, the way that we arrived, I mean, this is a deep mystery. Sci sci the scientific community is in pretty much in agreement that what we call anatomically modern human, AMH, we emerged about 200,000 years ago. Now, there some fossils suggest maybe a little bit earlier than that, but Pretty much right now, they agree on the 200,000 mark. The controversy is how did we get here? And where this conversation has taken a big turn is that we now have the ability to extract the DNA from the fossilized remains of ancient forms of life, including those that we used to believe were our ancestors. And when we do that and compare their, their genome to our genome, what we find is we did not descend from those earlier forms of life. We also find that we haven't changed in the 200,000 years. Our genome today is the genome that anatomically modern humans had 200,000 years ago. This is a problem for the evolutionary theory. And Alfred Wallace, who, who contributed to, to the theory, worked with Darwin, he had a corollary that, that states this very clearly. He said, nature never over endows. And what that means is that, that nature only gives a life form what it needs in the time that it needs to survive. The problem is we arrived 200,000 years ago, tremendously over endowed with capabilities, light years, what was needed for simple survival at that time. And we still have those those capabilities now, the ability to self-regulate our own biology consciously, at will, on demand, when we choose, to the best of our knowledge, no other form of life can do that. Some may do it by instinct, but not to sit down and, and consciously say, in this moment, I choose to enhance my immune response. I, I choose to awaken those longevity enzymes. I, I choose to awaken my super cognition, super memory. Uh, and it seems like the ability to choose stems from the ability to form language. Like we have all of our thoughts in language. You know, you might have spatial thoughts of how I can move something around, but in terms of actually being able to make the choice, I'm going to plan ahead and do this differently. It seems like all of this could go back to the singular mutation of the ability to harness sound yep. in a way that nobody had ever done before. And, and, and another point to that is just that... Chromosome 7, 200,000 years ago. Exactly. Maybe. And so the question, like, I think people really misconceive of evolution, that it's this slow, gradual process. But there's been a number of really compelling studies that you can wildly alter an organism in a number of generations if you select for one particular feature. Sure. There was the, these Arctic foxes. Bilayev's Arctic fox experiments, mm -hmm. yeah. So Bilayev and his group, research group were interested in domestication. And what they did is they had this tribe of foxes and each generation, they would select the ones that were friendliest to humans, the ones that would come up and would eat from the hand. And then they would breed them. And then over the course of three or four generations, which is very, very short, they had basically functionally domesticated the fox. Their color had changed, their song had changed, their ears started to droop like dog ears. And it was stunning because everybody thought that evolution of such distinct traits would have taken sure. hundreds, if not thousands of years. And he showed that by selecting four specific characteristics, you could actually basically get it overnight. Oh, sure. Well, and that's the problem. That's the problem is that the assumption is that evolution is a process that happens slowly, gradually over a long period of time. We don't fit. We that theory breaks down when it comes to anatomically modern humans. Scientists know it. It's, it's called the problem of evolution. And they don't know what to do about that problem. But the DNA, the ability to extract the DNA was a game changer. To be able, it was like, you know, when the movie Jurassic Park came out, that was science fiction. And in Jurassic Park, they actually brought the DNA back to life. To the best of my knowledge, we have not done that yet. But 
But well, there's a guy some... who's trying to, uh, he's trying to resuscitate woolly mammoths. Do you know I, about I was just going to say, in somebody's basement in some university, you know they're, they're trying to do it. But, the, but we can build the genome. And this was the game changer. We, we did not descend from Neanderthals, for example. When that was taught in schools, it's still being taught in some schools, even though the DNA doesn't support it. We shared the earth with them. We interbred with them. We didn't descend from them. And, uh, and the same is true for other forms of life. And it, it, it's interesting. If you go to the Smithsonian, for example, and you look at an evolutionary tree of life and you see humans, anatomically modern humans, usually up in the you know, upper left-hand corner, and then you see us connected to all these other forms of life, typically those connections are broken lines. And if you look at the legend, it will show you the broken lines say inferred or speculative uh, relationships. They are believed to exist, although there is no physical evidence that has been found that supports those. And they, what they say, when I talk to the, the paleontologists, they say, well, we just haven't looked in the right place. So they continue the search. Okay, uh, so what is, your, what is your solution to this? What you is know, your answer I, to I, it? Okay, I'm a scientist, and I don't have a solution. But what I want to say is this. When I began looking uh, deeply, for me, human chromosome 2 is the smoking gun. And if you look at a picture of human chromosome 2, it's, it's the second largest chromosome in our genome. It takes up about 8% of the, the DNA in the nucleus of our cell. And when you look at, if you actually can see a photomicrograph, what you will see, it, it is the product of two pre-existing chromosomes that were fused telomere to telomere. And you can actually see the pinch point, the narrow point where they were fused and what we now have are telomeres in the middle of a chromosome where they are typically found only on the ends. If that was all that would happen, I, I would say maybe something really bizarre happened one time that led to this. But now what the, the DNA studies are showing, the, the, um, the journal Nature in the volume genetics of 2012, they had a two-week conference on this. And what they found is that after the fusion happened, there were genes that were silenced, there were genes that were added, there were genes that re were removed to stabilize that fusion. All of them are the product, uh, and the scientific, the, the journal says, this is beyond anything that can be supported uh, through a natural process. So for me, as a scientist, I don't know what happened. What I have to say is there's been, it, it appears that there's some kind of intervention, and I don't know what that intervention is. If I look at only the genetics, now, if I look at all of the other evidence, if you look at the archaeological evidence, if you look at the anthropological evidence, if you look at the cultural evidence, if you look at the fossil evidence, and you look at the geologic evidence, or the um, uh, genetic evidence, uh, I believe that we are the product of, of some intervention, an intelligent, conscious intervention, at least one time. The fact that chromosome 2 was fused, genes were added and taken away at exactly the same time chromosome 7, after 175 million years of being stable, only for us, there was that little switch, and, and there are others as well. And, and then since that time, the genome has been stable, that we, we have essentially the same genome now that we have then, and that those changes allowed for our uniquely human characteristics. It was chromosome two, and there's a gene called TBR number one that allows for a, a, a neocortex, a brain 50% larger than our nearest primates, 76% of, of our neocortex. This is where empathy sympathy, a compassion, and the ability to self-regulate are all focused in the part of the neocortex that is only possible because of what happened with chromosome number two. The ability to express those things in, through what happened in chromosome seven. Up until 2012, how that would have happened is a mystery. After 2012, when the technology of CRISPR was made public, 
it looks like that we are the product of something like a CRISPR intervention. The question is, who had CRISPR 200,000 years ago? <laughs> I, I don't know as a scientist. I don't know the answer to that. I have my own feelings. And what the archaeological evidence and the cultural evidence all suggests that we have strong relationship with a community that's not bound to this world. Now, well, wh whether that's a time-space relationship or a planetary, I, I don't know. The, as a scientist, I don't know. But I, I do strongly believe that we are more than random processes uh, and random mutations of lucky biology. I have to say that. Can you elaborate on the mechanism by which you think CRISPR is capable of such a thing? Because from everything that I've seen, the way that CRISPR works is through really small shifts in the DNA. Yeah. Well, that's our CRISPR that is only 20 years old. And if we are the product, I mean, we're as a society. So these things aren't happening in a vacuum. This conversation is not happening in a vacuum. We are now as a society undergoing a process of openly talking about a relationship with forms of life that are not from this planet. It's called disclosure. And it's happening in a very planned uh, way uh, based upon studies that were done back in the 1960s of how humans, anthropologically, how humans assimilate information showing that they are they are not alone. Based on anthropological studies in Africa and South America, when these, these cultures believe that they, they were the superior culture, and then outsiders from the West came in, it destroyed the fabric of their society. And based upon that belief, the Rand Corporation, for example, released reports that said, you know, you can't, you can't just say this to the world. It has to be done incrementally. And I think that's what's happening now. But if if we have been visited, as the archaeological evidence suggests, through the images, the anthropological evidence, and the cultural evidence, through the oral traditions and the stories of indigenous people from all over the world, then who or whatever that is, we have to assume if they've got the technology to get here, whether it's in space-time, our future, or whether it's from an, another location, in this dimension, that they have technology that far exceeds what we're only beginning to understand now. So, so when I look at, uh, I personally, I think that the we're only beginning to understand the DNA and, and what has happened in the, in the DNA. And the other thing, I mean, we could go on and on with this. My, I mean, I'm just, I wonder if you're, I, I'm, when I hear these narratives about the UAPs and so forth being given prime mm -hmm. time, I'm also deeply suspicious of what's going on because this is the same monolithic narrative business that we've seen with a lot of these other disinformation campaigns yeah. that are aimed at making people feel small and helpless and so forth. And, you know, I, I'm completely, I don't, I've never seen an alien before or anything. So I'm like completely open minded that I, this. I'm, could, I'm totally, I'm so totally with you on this. I think that this is another example. I think it's where factual information is being skewed to direct a narrative. And if you look closely, it's being fed to us as a threat. Mm -hmm. And that is very concerning to me because people are being taught to fear this potential relationship. Uh, and there's a remedy for that fear because it is being disclosed through military channels. For me, that, that's a, a very concerning perspective when you look culturally and anthropologically from other other cultures their relationship to to beings whether they're physical non-physical interdimensional you know what whatever it is uh has not been something to fear and if the technology is as advanced as we suspect that it probably is uh and i'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute um if they wanted to hurt us, it would have happened a long time ago, and it could happen whenever they wanted it to happen. Having worked, okay, I had a, I had a, 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 a yellow badge is a secret clearance uh, civilian. So I was civilian working DOD uh, under the Air Force in the Cold War years. And there were technologies that were alluded to in, in that time. And so this is, you know, 1980s 
that so far are so far advanced from the combustion kinds of technologies uh, that we, you know, think of now. I mean, it makes it makes Elon Musk rockets look like toys because they're they're all based on on burning something to create heat and thrust to get somewhere, which is so very different than the Planck field energy, which is based upon uh, uh, a motion at the most fundamental level of our existence, what now is being called the Higgs field that has been confirmed at the CERN superconducting super collider. We, it's no longer a theory. That field is there. It is comprised of uh, a very small, uh, rapidly moving uh, elements and the the idea that that motion can be captured and harmonized and bumped up into to a usable energy that idea has been around for a very long time and i've i've seen uh people who have been able to harness it in different levels not on a commercially viable level but they've demonstrated that the principle actually exists so i think what have you, what have you seen i've i've seen devices that do that that actually capture you know they they harmonize, uh, and there's, you know, different, I mean, there, there are conferences where people display these things. I was a member of the Tesla Society back in the 1980s and other societies that go along with that. And there are examples of that technology that were demonstrated at the annual conferences. Well, even, so, even like Michael McCullough, right, the physicist from Plymouth, he's able to do very small scale uh, what is the effect? It does Compton uh, propulsion devices. Very, very weak. Casimir effect. Casimir, excuse me. Oh, the, Casimir. the ca Casimir effect is, yeah. is one. That's one of the places. But, but the point is there are so many forms of technology that are based upon the understanding. It all comes down to a fundamental understanding of, of the nature of reality. And the okay, so that's, of, a, that's a really good point, because the nature of reality is something that is subject to manipulation. And so sure. you think about something like uh, D-Day, and the way that the military strategists organized themselves was to create basically a fake landing party yep. to create the illusion that they were going to land one place and then to actually land in a totally different place. And so you have this very, very effective strategy of subterfuge and confusion and the bending of reality to create the desired outcomes. And so now I start to think about disclosure and I'm like, okay, there is something like $20 trillion missing from the Pentagon budget, like money that's just vanished. And so the most parsimonious explanation in my book is I'm like, well, they've taken that money and they've been working on stuff behind the scenes because the vision that we have of the way that the world works is not what's actually happening. And so you think about even something like Los Alamos. Nobody knew about Los Alamos. That was a totally top secret project. They built a town in the desert, populated it, kept people there, and made something that then one day was just deployed. And so to me, it seems like the most parsimonious explanation for all of the weird things that are happening is that this is, uh, you know, the most banal terrestrial event possible, which is just the military industrial complex doing what it does. And I'm supported in that feeling because have you ever looked at a map of UFO sightings from like 1940s to today? Not recently. I, I know a lot of them actually started in 1933 in Italy. And then 1940s, New Mexico was a, a, right in my backyard where I visited these sites. And then so it goes on from there. They're almost all in the United States and Europe. And people give a lot of explanations for not, this. There's not, not really, not really. I mean, those, those are the no, ones the, that are the made. The map is... Those, I, are so the ones made, those are the ones made public by the people that want us to think that. But I spend, I spend a tremendous amount of time in South America and in Peru, and they have been there, uh, Venezuela, Chile. Uh, yeah, they just go by different names, right? Like those people yeah. obviously don't call them UFOs necessarily throughout well, history. Well, this is, this is an America centric map, <laughs> you know, but they're, but they're, they're present in, in other parts of the world. I, I believe that, uh, I, I know that we have parallel paths of physics and technology. There's, i just give you a perfect example. When, when I was, when I did work at Vandenberg Air Force Base, 
for example. I was given a pass on the base. And I finished my my work early one day, and it's a beautiful base in Northern California. I mean, absolutely stunning, you know, rolling green hills. And um, I said, do you mind if I look around? And they said, no, you know, your pass is good till the end of the day. And I said, is there any place I shouldn't go? And they said, don't worry. If you end up there, they'll let you know. I said, cool. So I was driving around. I came up on this hilltop, and I looked down, and here was a, a beautiful, huge launch facility that looked just like Cape Kennedy at that time. Uh, I'd never heard about it before. And I had a little Instamatic camera, and I, I started taking some pictures. And all of a sudden, a couple of MP Jeeps, they come roaring up the road, and they said, you know, we have to ask you to leave, and we have to take, take your camera. And I said, oh, they were very nice. And I said, I said okay, that's, that's fine. I said, can you tell me what I'm looking at? And they said, this is called Slick Six. And I said, what is Slick Six? Did you guys, did you see the movie Contact? Oh, yeah. There's mm-hmm. a, a very famous line in there where a piece of equipment is built and it's destroyed and they think it's gone. And the scientist says, why build one when you can build two for twice the price? And that's exactly what happened. What I was looking at was the mirror image of Cape, what's now Cape Canaveral, mm. um, that continued with the, the Apollo programs. It, it continued with, uh, with launches that were military, whereas Florida is civilian. Those you have to announce. The other ones you don't. So we have parallel space projects. We had something called the Space Command back then. It's the, Trump didn't start it. The Space Command, I used to drive onto the base and it said U.S. Space Command. It was right there. So we've had this stuff and we just don't hear about it a lot. And I'm, I'm not saying anything. It's not public knowledge. You know, I mean, if you know where to look, this is all public knowledge right now. Uh, we have parallel energy programs. We have parallel physics programs that are not based in conventional physics as we understand them today. And, and I've met people that work in, in these programs. So. I think we are at a point, and, and uh, I'm going to use this, to, I'm going to have to go here in a few minutes. I've got another interview. But I, I think this illustrates the point that we began with. We, we are living this rare and precious moment in time. It's, it is a rare moment in the history of any civilization. It's, it's a rare moment in the history of our nation and of all nations. It's a rare moment in the history of humankind where we're at this powerful crossroad where we have to make a choice and the choice is whether or not the role that we allow technology to play in our lives the technology is benign it's the thinking underlying the technology and anastasia you you nailed this so beautifully because you know when we're talking about uh where the narrative is coming from. What is the thinking underlying the narrative about our relationship to beings from another world? I mean, we could just as easily be having a narrative saying there's a highly advanced species that cares about us and our future. And they once were where we are right now. And they made mistakes that they don't want us to make. And and they're going to to you know, to help us along. That is a narrative that could be out there. You're not seeing anything like that. It's the thinking underlying the information. So the better we know ourselves, this is the key for me of everything we're saying here. The better we know ourselves, the less we fear change in the world. The better we know ourselves, the less we fear one another and the unknown. And perhaps most importantly, the better we know ourselves, the less we fear our own power. We are immensely powerful beings in this world with the ability to interact with our environment and our reality and our own biology in ways that no other form of life can. And we're at the precipice of giving that away if we don't understand who we are. And I think that's the value of having conversations like this. And that's why I so appreciate you, uh, the work that you do. And your, we, the truth is, this is an unscripted conversation. We didn't know where this was going to go. So your willingness to trust me with your community and with your audience to, to have this conversation, this very, very important conversation. So I, I want to just acknowledge that uh, and say thank you for your trust and for, 
for the time that we've shared together today. I'm enjoying it tremendously. Thank you so and much. Thank Greg. you so much too. And thank you for trusting us too that uh that we're here to actually understand what's going on in the world and not to really, you know, entrench ourselves into our you know, the way we think that it's going, but explore the possibilities that could be well, out there. Well, I so in the three minutes now that I have left, I'm gonna ask you, are you optimistic about where we're going? Are you optimistic about our future? You're closer to the young people than than I am because you are your educators. So I'm I'm curious to know how do you feel about where we are and where we're going. I think it's a it's an inflection point. I think that there's the possibility that it goes well, and I think that there's the possibility that it goes very much not well. Mm. And I tend to look at it that we have a responsibility to push it in the direction of helping it go better, and that's kind of the point of of this entire platform is to create a space where people can come together and talk about what is yet uncertain and unknown so that we can maybe move in a direction that is less dystopian than the one that is sold to us in the fictions and the, and the stories mm. that we tell right now. I love yeah, it I when, you talk, when you talk that way. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I just get a lot of pleasure from seeing people's minds open up, whether it's students or just any conversation I have with, with a guest like you or anybody. When you see that people are, are able to reframe their lives in terms of the purpose, and the purpose is obviously to make the the future better for for the humans that come next to make this planet more harmonious to make this ecosystem a better interconnected world and i just find that that's what students really respond to that's that's the lectures that when i get into this stuff i have people emailing me after you know this really changed my life like mm. i i'm looking at my day differently now and so i think it is absolutely possible for humans to level up it's just a matter of fighting that incredible tide of of growth that people are obsessed with and i just mean gdp kind of growth not the real growth that's yeah. actually helping us make a better world so it's going to be a hell of a fight but i think we can do it well i'm, I'm inspired by both of you and uh and i want to say thank you you know when i when i think about this i'm sure you're familiar with the work of buckminster fuller oh, yeah. uh and i i'm a hu- i never met him when he was alive i wish i had of uh he died during the cold cold war years but he's, he, of all the things that he said that were so powerful, there was one statement that he made that sticks with me. And I, I think about it at least once a day when I come up against uh, any kind of, you know, the, the kinds of things we're talking about now. And what, what he said is, he said, you're never going to change the world by fighting against the things you don't like. He said, to bring about real change, find a new way that makes the old ways obsolete and people yeah. will follow the new way. And this is... This, I think there's a lot of truth in this. People will follow the new way and, and the old ideas simply collapse. You don't have to fight against them. We're, and there's a huge difference between moving toward a dream and fighting against a nightmare. Absolutely. And I think, I think we have this potential and what you're doing with young people is so important to empower them to move toward a dream. And, and another way of saying it from a spiritual perspective is do we make the choice out of the love that we have for ourselves and what's possible or out of the fear for what happens if we don't? And some people say, you know, that I'm splitting hairs. But I think there's a powerful difference between moving forward in our love for the dream that we have as a species and what we know the good and the beauty that we know is possible. That's very different than making those choices because we're afraid of what happens if we don't. And, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. That's absolutely right. Beautifully said. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll let you, with, we'll let you get on. With that, yeah, I'm going to jump on to, uh, to a taped interview here. All, All right, right, sir. Thank you so much for coming by. I hope we can meet up again down the line. Thank you so much. I want to say hello and thank you to the community watching. Thank you for all you're doing to be the best version of yourself and to make the best world possible. And I look forward to our next. <laughs>